welcome to episode two of Wikimove. This is a new podcast in audio and video where we discuss the future of the Wikimedia movement. I'm Nicole Ebber and with me is Nikki Zeuner. We both work in Wikimedia Deutschland's movement strategy and global relations team. This episode was recorded at 2 p.m. UTC on April 29th, 2022. Things may have changed since we recorded this show, but what we still know is that by 2030, Wikimedia will become the essential infrastructure of the ecosystem of free knowledge, and anyone who shares our vision will be able to join us. So Wikimove is a new podcast for frank conversations about topics related to movement strategy. It's not about having all the answers. It's more about exploring questions together, about thinking together um, on stage and on air. And the topics come from the strategic direction. They come from the principles, the recommendations, um, and whatever topics may arise from, from all that, um, and the initiatives and the implementation of, of movement strategy. Um, or we can also maybe in the future talk about larger issues in the, in the larger knowledge ecosystem that are relevant to our transformation. So um, we hope that this space will create opportunities to think together, to exchange, to spread ideas, to maybe develop ideas, dream about our, our joint future as a Wikimedia movement. And um, this home base is not only the audio and the video cast, but we also have a meta page and a web page, and soon we'll be all over the Pod, podverse <laughs> and we we try to uh, spread as much as we can um, also the, all the relevant links and stuff that we talk about later um, there will be um, links in the show notes and um, uh, this episode is available with Portuguese subtitles on YouTube and you'll hear in a minute about why that is also, for those uh, of you watching the video format, you might notice that we've changed home, we've changed surroundings, and we're excited to try out this new space. So on today's show, we have two guests from Wiki Movimento Brazil. Because the Brazilian and Portuguese speaking communities, movement strategy is alive and kicking for them. People are actively thinking about what it will take to build a hub, for example, about growing the movement and about building capacity. Much of this is thanks to our two wonderful guests in today's show, Erika Azzellini and Lucas Pianta. But more on this later. First, news, news from the movement. In this section, We want to share information about events and activities in our movement. And although I would say that we kind of have a good radar on what is going on, we would love to hear from you. Um, what, what news should we feature in the next show? So please go to our meta page and let us know what is happening in your organization or in your community. So Nikki, what's new? So first I want to say the annual Wikimedia Hackathon is happening next month um, or this month, depending on when you're listening to this show. So in May, it's, it'll be from May 20 to 22. And there's an open call for um, sessions on the schedule page on Meta. Um, if you'd like to host a session, you can simply pick an open slot in the category which best fits your topic. And um, there's also some suggestions on how to put together fun sessions. So we're We're moving more and more into doing this online. Apparently, I remember live hackathons a while ago, and it, it was a wholly different thing. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is, even though we ha have our own grants um, at the, at the, in the Wikimedia movement, the Open Knowledge Foundation is also announcing a launch of Open Data Day 2022 small grants applications. So you can use that money to uh, host open data events and activities across the world. And they're very really small, depending on the types of events. They support organizations with $500 or $1,000. Um, deadline for the application is May 13th. Um, and the events uh, will take place in June, like throughout the summer. Um, and the grants will favor work across disciplines, targeted campaigns, advocacy app, app efforts to support the Paris Agreement, local efforts tackling climate change, and using open data for social impact. That sounds a little bit like topics for impact. Um, one of our recommendations. Um, so 
cool uh, sister organization from the open knowledge uh, movement is also spreading money for good work. Then we have Wiki Loves Earth happening again. Um, speaking of impact, so that that international photo contest has started also by the time we air this pod. Um, it raises public awareness about protected areas and creates the biggest database of free photos of nature heritage sites all over the world. That's been going on since 2013. The first one was held in the Ukraine, actually. And um, lots and lots of thousands and hundreds of thousands of free photos on commons, thanks to that. So this runs uh, May 1st, to July 31st, which different dates, with different dates for each country. So you can join that by checking out the respective pages on Meta. Um, also, politically, some things have been happening in Europe. Can you tell us about that, Nicole? Yes. Um, last weekend, which when you will be listening to this will be a little bit longer ago. So on April 23rd, the European Union reached an agreement on the Digital Services Act, which you might also know under DSA. And if you follow the news from the Free Knowledge Advocacy Group EU, you will be most likely familiar with the term and with what's going on. So the DSA provides quite good approaches already for dealing with illegal content on online platforms without restricting the right um, to freedom of expression. And what Wikimedia particularly welcomes in the DSA is that is it really distinguishes between the moderation of content by commercial service providers and by those by volunteer editing communities. So that is good. But um, we would still have liked to see even greater recognition of communities and how they actually handle their content moderation. We also find it a little bit problematic that the negotiations have been brought to an end in such a hasty way and that they are, they are lacking proper public deliberation and transparency, actually. However, I think the fact that they distinguish between the dark side and the light side is uh, a little bit thanks to us and, and the advocacy work we've done in yes. uh, not us here, but um, the uh, colleagues in the Brussels office. That is the case. Yes. And shout out to them, actually. Demi, Anna, yeah. great sure. work and great connection with all the all European affiliates. What's happening with the Universal Code of Conduct? There's more good news, uh, actually. Since our last episode, the results of the community vote on the enforcement guidelines of the Universal Code of Conduct, formerly also known, I think, as EDGAR, but I think we stop stopped using <laughs> that term, uh, the results have been announced. And um, they have actually received 58.6% yes, uh, yes votes and many, many comments for improvement, actually. And instead of the Wikimedia Foundation board now just going ahead and moving on to also vote on these guidelines, it has been decided that the drafting committee will actually be brought back together and they will undertake another round of community engagement to refine the enforcement guidelines, which will then hopefully be in place. So for me, this is really, first of all, a very strong signal, um, basically a yes for providing more safety and inclusion across our movement and also that community voices are being heard to continue to improve the document. And as always, you will find all of that on Meta. And I was going to ask you oh. <laughs> <laughs> your favorite, favorite event of all times. Yeah, my favorite, favorite event of all times in Berlin. Okay. And that is not a Wikimedia event. Let's put it that way. <laughs> is uh, Republika. And this is really one of the first in-person events me and some of my colleagues will be attending after 2020 is Republika. It is a three-day festival for the digital society that takes place in Berlin from 8th to 10th of June. The motto is, any way the wind blows. <laughs> and it's not only for the great karaoke reference that I like and wholeheartedly recommend this event. It's really a great opportunity to meet and connect with my like-minded people from fields like politics, media, science, activism, climate change, knowledge curation. I could go on and on, on, and on here. 
and to discuss also the current challenges of our time. And there will be sessions and talks also uh, in English. So please consider participating and let us know if you go so that we can meet. So is this also going to be a hybrid event or do you have, have to do it in person? I actually think you have to kind of have to, yeah, uh, it will be, it will be both, but I think, uh, sessions will be streamed. They have always been streamed, um, live, but the mode of participation is, I think, not hybrid that you can also connect with, with speakers and so on. Okay. All right. So for a segment we call, is it hope I'm feeling? Uh, Nicole, I can we also sing it? <laughs> no, I'm not going to. Uh, I heard that Wikimedia Commons was mentioned in the recently released uh, Wikimedia Foundation annual plan. Do you know more? Isn't that a surprise and, and very nice thing? It is indeed in their annual plan draft. And that states clearly the core multimedia infrastructure of Wikimedia Commons is in desperate need of repair. I've never read it in such a clear way probably everybody has known this, everybody has known this yes but it's not really written like this in the draft and that it is a priority they will set for the year ahead which is really uh, amazing and it is part of the deepen our commitment to knowledge as a service goal so yeah there's hope that wikimedia commons this like vast and unique platform for all kinds of free media uh, it will get the attention it deserves so it can be accessible and used by everyone so shout out to the foundation and shout out to mariana i, I actually feel like the annual plan is I, i've read it and i was like okay yeah it covers all the things that are important to us now it's a question of getting it done obviously but Yeah, good start. Okay, so with that, we can move to our interview today, Nicole. And I'm going to do like a little bit introduction on what we're going to talk about today. So, oh, here yeah, I did it again. I did the noise that I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> uh, Wikimed Movimento Brazil has been working hard to make movement strategy a topic of conversation and co-thinking in their country's community. And as well as for the whole Lusophone communities, actually, across the globe. Our guests today are engaged in movement strategy and at so many levels. It's going to be a long list, um, both globally and regionally. In particular, they have tried to take the strategy to a next level by contextualizing it to, to the Lusophone or the Brazilian context. And they're making sure that the conversation didn't stop after the recommendations were published. Um, they did a survey recently where they asked a series of questions to the Portuguese speaking communities about some of the big juicy concepts in uh, movement uh, strategy 2030 recommendations, um, particularly equity and decision making is one of the things they looked at, leadership development and diversity. By doing that, uh, or in doing that, they also reached out to many community members who had not previously had the chance to engage with movement strategy. And so today we want to talk about these issues, ideas, the opportunities and challenges that emerge from the survey and then take it from there. Um, I think these Wikimedians are showing the way of how we can make strategy come to life at a community level and jointly figure out what the next steps are uh, that we have to take locally and regionally. And then, of course, also what the next steps are that we have to take um, in terms of governance and resources uh, globally. So, our, our guests today are Erika Alzellini. I hope I, Erika, I hope I'm saying your, word, your name right, um, has been serving Wiki Movimento Brasil in different hats over the last years. As a staff member, she's now in charge of community support, partnerships, and strategy development at Wiki Movimento Brasil. Erika is also a member of, the diverse, of their diversity committee. She was responsible for reimagining Wikidata uh, from the margins that happened last year under the context of Wikidatacon, which they co-organized with Wikimedia Germany. Um, and now she's at the core organization team of Wikicon Brazil, and we'll hear more about that later. Erika is a member of the Movement Charter Drafting Committee, and she is joining us from Sao Paulo today. Hi, Erika. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. 
Our other guest today is Lucas Piantin. He has been working as a researcher on the movement strategy implementation in the Lusophone, which is the Portuguese speaking community and the community engaging in topics such as equity and decision making, diversity, governance and leadership development. He is a member of the Latin America and the Caribbean Regional Grants Committee and a member of Wikicon Brazil's 2022's Executive and Scholarship Committees, a member of Wikimovimento Brazil's Strategy Working Group, and also a member of Creative Commons Brazil's Open Glam Coordination. So, wow, quite, quite, quite a list. And Lucas is joining us from Porto Alegre today. So, hi, Lucas. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Excellent. And we start right away and dive into the research, Lucas, that have you, you have been doing. Um, can you give us an overview of the survey that you did and what came out of it? And talk probably also a little bit about how you came up with the questions and what you were trying to find out with your research. Well, uh, this research we did was mainly about uh, equity in decision making, the governance, leadership developing, and uh, some other recommendations of the movement strategy. We were trying to find exactly what was um, what would be the challenges and possibilities of implementing a hub in our community, uh, and mainly a Lusophone hub. So we wanted to know uh, how could we uh, build the, the path to, to implement a Lusophone hub in our community. So the questions we made uh, in this uh, questionnaire, they were uh, not exactly or not only about hubs and equity and decision making, but about lots of other um, things about the movement strategy. Uh, because we didn't actually know, and we don't actually know yet, what, uh, what exactly a hub is, what hubs could do, what hubs couldn't do, even though we have some, some idea of, of uh, the, the very nature of hubs. So we wanted to make it uh, as broad as we could for, for people to give their answers in lots of topics and for us to identify what could be the challenges and possibilities of a, and possibilities of a hub. So um, the, the questions we made so then are uh, come up from uh, some other researches that have been uh, made in our community about, for example, leadership uh, development and other topics such as uh, diversity and some other challenges that we uh, see that could be we could be facing or that we could face in the future when what what is related to the movement strategy. So those are uh, the questions we made were. Uh, about those kinds of topics. And we found out in the end that our community is not very aware of what a hub is, and our community is not very aware also of what is the movement strategy. Uh, more than a half of the people who answered the questionnaire told us that they didn't have uh, any information about the movement strategy before answering the questionnaire. So uh, we found that uh, before trying to implement a hub, we should face some challenges and some very important things that are related to the information of our community and the way our community is uh, related to the movement strategy. So that's, to me, it's it's super interesting because there's so many other um, communities and, and groups of, of uh, Wikimedians around the world who are also looking at hubs and that you had sort of this, this honest look <laughs> at, okay, what would it mean and, and, and what would be the challenges? And... Uh, if I understand correctly, also coming to a point where we're saying, well, maybe a hub is not immediately the solution that we need for equity and decision making. Is that correct? So you're basically, um, you're basically now have to think of other things uh, you want to do in terms of uh, improving um, equity and decision making. Yeah, exactly. We, we found that uh, if you want to talk about equity and decision making, we need to think about it not only in our community, but in the Wikimedia movement as a whole. And we think that uh, our community not knowing what the movement strategy is and our community not having access to the, those kinds of information may be uh, a problem in the web equity in decision-making or a web equity problem uh, in, a, in a wider view on the Wikimedia movement. For example, lots of people in our community don't speak English. So how can we be part of the of the movement, Wikimedia movement globally, or the, the strategy discussions, for example, if we don't speak English? Uh, how can we read the documentation of, this, of those meetings if we don't speak English? 
don't we cannot read, read uh, what is the documentation that is in English. So there are some lots of problems that lead us to think that we must uh, work on uh, capacity building and we we must work on leadership development to make sure that uh, at least for now some of the people who have the opportunity of being in those in those uh, different uh, places or those different um, um, sides of the movement uh, could be there. So we, we want to make. We, I think that we need to make sure before trying to implement a hub that we have a a, a good participation and a good information and a good way of communication about the movement strategy in our community. I want to turn to Erica here because um, you you have a little bit. I mean, you have your Brazilian view and Lucifon community view, but you also have, I imagine, a larger movement view as well. What, what are your thoughts on hubs and, and um, how could they shape our movement and how should we go about it? Well, I think it's nice to see all the ideas coming up to surface regarding the hubs because I understand this as a collective effort for bringing materiality to the movement strategy recommendations, right? So now it's time to think about them locally and see how we can better collaborate in the movement in order to, you know, achieve our abstract purposes of knowledge equity and knowledge as a service. And I see all this conversation around hubs as the community trying to solve that, right? So that's on the positive side. I see good faith and a lot of energy directed to hubs right now. And I'm an advocate for reimagining our structures of governance, right? On the other hand, it leads us to challenges of making things actually happen because it requires coordination across different entities, engagement from individuals and communities who have been part of this for a long time now and some others that are just joining the conversation at this point, right? So how do we balance that? And my concerns about hubs that I'll use every opportunity I have to express them is that we need more clarity about the governance models that we are going to use for the hubs. Otherwise, we are just substituting a model for another and we'll keep excluding marginalized communities from the spaces of decision or for the resources allocation, for example. So my take here is that we should not fasten up this process, although I know that this is very important for the movement to advance on its strategy, right? But I think that we should focus on our local necessities and try to reimagine what kind of challenges the hubs are really trying to solve and what does it mean for the communities in case they don't even want to join a hub, for example, what are the consequences, right? So I think that this is the kind of discussion that we should have in the movement right now and that we shouldn't rush to, you know, start uh, piloting a hub just to see what happens because by the end of the day, people will only get frustrated and... You know, we already had a lot of problems regarding mistrust in the movement, and we don't want people to disengage at this point. We want them to keep collaborating and thinking together. And I really appreciate this effort of thinking globally, but also locally. And we have to balance that in order to make equity in decision making not just a concept, but actually a practice. So I want to pick up on one of the things that... Um that Lucas said in the beginning is, is you, you said people don't really, you haven't really engaged with movement strategy and they don't really know what a hub is. We, we were also talking earlier about the word hub doesn't exist in Portuguese. So they're just using, um, using the English word for lack of a better term. Um, but I think it kind of pointed to maybe we need to build some awareness and some capacity in the communities first, before we start with this, concept, which makes no sense to anybody. So I want to turn the conversation a little bit to capacity building and hand it back to Nicole because we have a question about that. Yeah, I have a question to Erika. Um, so Wikimedia Deutschland and your organization co-organized WikidataCon last year. And I kind of heard and felt that you've got the conference bug, so to say, that, um, yeah, and you are now organizing the first ever Wikicon Brazil this year. And yeah, I wanted to hear a little bit from you. What are you hoping to accomplish with this event in terms of like building the movement in Brazil? Yeah, indeed, I got the conference bug. 
<laughs> and I'm realizing that although it is a very stressful process to organize a conference, it is also quite rewarding when you see your loved community having the space they need to connect with each other, strengthen their bonds and collaborate more, right? And even though they come from different backgrounds, right? So this is the magic of organizing Wikimedia events. And we were quite experimental with Wikidata Con last year because we didn't want to have an ordinary event, right? But instead, we wanted to make it meaningful experience, especially for people in underrepresented communities, even though it was a remote event. And honestly, this kind of reflects the spirit that we have uh, at Wiki Movimento Brasil, right? And I hope our friends at Wikimedia Deutschland are not very traumatized by our bold ideas. <laughs> but yeah, we want to use our first ever in-person conference for the Brazilian community as a platform for connection, of course, but not on a traditional top-down presentation mode, right? So this reflects on how we are building the actual program, right? So for us, it's very important at this point to distribute capacity across our country. And Brazil is a continental country with a lot of different regional contexts. And we, as we Movement Brazil, want to stimulate local empowerment. And we don't want to concentrate all of our wiki activities in the richest regions of Brazil. So we are trying to find ways to make people empowered locally. And this has a lot to do with capacity building, right? So, for example, we just created a scholarship distribution model that is not necessarily attached to a presentation submission and that has a mechanism for prioritizing the different diversities we want to see represented in the event. And we are valuing a lot regional representativeness in the conference, right? And they will be required to participate in different capacity building sessions and strategic discussions. And those strategic discussions will actually revolve around the movement strategy recommendations as well in our own local context. So they don't need to understand what happened before, you know, with the movement strategy. They don't need to have prior knowledge or understand the very details of this amazing thing that we are doing in the movement, but they will have a space to say what they're thinking and what does it mean for us here locally, right? So they're, of course, Welcome to submit proposals, but our main goal here with that is to ensure that people who are willing to learn more about uh, how to engage with the community in a meaningful way can do that and feel empowered after the conference itself. So we are using the conference as a platform for connecting uh, people who are more experienced in the movement, but also to bring more diversity to the table and make things move forward in that direction so we can disseminate Wikimedia movement in Brazil and also have people empowered locally. So we are very bold with our proposal for this conference. It will happen by the end of July. And I hope to share uh, our insights after that with the whole community, because I think that this is very experimental what we are doing here, especially for our first ever conference in Brazil. That sounds really awesome. Explain this a little bit. Um, so it sounds like you have, you're creating a hybrid conference, right? So there's like local events, but everything is connected through, through an online um, system or how does it work? How is it going to work? No, it's actually going to happen on site. So we will be gathering around 100 people here in Sao Paulo, my city. And this is why we developed this scholarship model so we could ensure that people could come here because air tickets right now in Brazil are insanely high. So the, the tickets skyrocket in its prices and we wanted to make sure that people would have the resources to be here with us discussing all these important matters and connecting with us in person. Okay. All right. Great. I have one follow-up question. Is it still possible to register for the event? And if so, how could people um, yeah, participate? How, they, how can they become involved? Yeah, we'll open our uh, subscription for the event on May 15th. But as it is a national conference and the program is designed in Portuguese, we are upsetting people who speak Portuguese. So... If anyone in the movement uh, happens to be here in Brazil and speaks Portuguese and wants to join us, please do it. That sounds great. 
So um, I'm going to turn back to Lucas for a minute. And um, because you told me you are also applying for funding from the Wikimedia Foundation, one of those uh, famous movement strategy implementation grants, um, and that's around leadership development. So what are you talking a little bit about what you're proposing there? Well, uh, what we're proposing now is um, using uh, the, the Wikicon Brazil 2022 as a platform for us to find what are the, the main topics of interest of uh, the Brazilian Wikimedians in this uh, on um, leadership development and who are the people who are uh, interested in, in uh, being leaderships. And also one of the most important things that we want to know with the community is what is leadership? What does it mean? What uh, we expect from a leadership? What does a leader do? Uh, and how is it uh, related to the Wikimedia movement and how is it related to our reality in Brazil? So uh, we want to uh, talk to people on, uh, during Wikicon Brazil and we want to listen to people during Wikicon Brazil and be part of uh, as uh, much as conferences and, and, and uh, discussions as we can to uh, find out how people feel about it and how people um, what people think about those topics of interest and um, then uh, trying to build with, with the, the community a leadership development plan, plan a leadership development plan. So uh, in this plan, we want to know, uh, for example, as I said, uh, who are the people who are interested? What are the topics of interest? And we want to bring uh, Wikimedians from different places, from, from other communities to share their expertise and sh share their learnings in, in the, the movement strategy with us. So we want to focus this leadership development plan in the movement strategy and what we plan to do at the end of this um, of this capacity building um, period is that we uh, we want uh, to help people on uh, asking for movement uh, implementation strategy grants. So we want to uh, help people on the capacities they want to build, uh, focusing on what our community needs and what our community thinks about leadership, and then uh, spreading uh, all those people and making everyone who participate participated in this uh, in this plan to be able to uh, ask them for uh, ask for their own movement strategy implementation grants and implement a, implement the strategy in our community so we, this is uh, a wider plan that wants to build capacity for people to be leaderships in the movement strategy implementation in our community so are you also going to provide trainings under this current grant or is it is that for later grants that people can after you have the plan then people can apply for for um grants that that fund yeah. trainings at first we're going to build the plan then we will um, show our community the plan and we'll ask people to to um be part of it and we want to know who wants to, to join and then we'll uh capacitate the people and at the end we, we are going to help everyone to to build their um proposals so I think there's quite a few um, applicants, movement strategy implementation grants who are doing similar things. So it'd be also interesting to see what you guys are experiencing and learning doing this and as well as, you know, maybe comparable communities in Africa or elsewhere that are also doing capacity assessments and, and things in, in that way. Um, it's, it's, it's really... Um, interesting that so many people start with this assessment piece. Um, and I'm wondering if there's some way maybe um, that all the, the data that is gathered could be made sense of in a, in a global manner and not just in a local manner. Um, but that might be a question to Yop at the Movement Strategy Implementation team or to, to other people uh, working on evaluation and learning of, around those grants. Because it, it feels like you're all learning so much and it should be, should be shared with, with others in the movement. Um, so I know we have a couple of other topics that we, we, uh, we want to touch on, um, today. Um, we talked about grants and resources. And so I'm, I want to kind of steer us into that direction a little bit. Um, so right now we have, a system of grant making by which resources are distributed in the movement. Um, and we also have, as an aside, these movement strategy implementation grants. Um, when we worked on the, um, on, in phase two of the strategy, the, the 
resource uh, allocation, or what are they called? Revenue de uh, revenue generation? No, re resource allocation oh, yeah, it was and just revenue resource. streams. Yeah, that was know. the other. It but. was two different uh, groups. But anyway, they had a very strong recommendation. Do you remember that, Nicole? Yeah, they, they actually recommended that a significant amount of resources will be spent for marginalized communities, emerging communities, and those in the so-called global south. But yes, there's no system for that yet. And meanwhile, the Wikimedia Foundation has tried to take a step towards more participatory grant making through the newly established grant committees or regional grant committees. And Lucas, I know you're a member of um, such a regional committee. And can you talk a little bit about how, how you think that is working at the moment? How is it, um, how is it going? So, well, uh Well, in the South uh, Latin American and the Caribbean uh, grant committee, we are now in the second round of alliances and community funds. So uh, we had the, the first uh, experience with it. And then we had uh, lots of feedback from the affiliates and from the people who are who are uh, proposing those grants and also from the members of the committee. And uh, now we're trying to solve some problems and trying to think about how to manage some of the, the challenges that we have. Some of those challenges are, for example, how can we be sure that we are being fair to the, to the people who are uh, applying for grants, for example? So uh, what are the, the, the skills or, or, or the capacities that we should have as a committee to, to be fair with those, those, those people? How can we communicate better with those people? Uh, how can we make sure that, for example, we are, we are uh, being equitable? In our movement, so there are some some uh, communities, uh, even in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, who are uh, who have more people involved. For affiliates that have uh, 20, 20 or forty people, when there are affiliates with much less people, so there are affiliates who have uh, very huge annual plans. There are some affiliates who have uh, plans that are not even for one year because, uh, well, maybe um, we don't have the the experience or they have the resources that we need to make something bigger. So uh, those are some questions that we, we are asking ourselves, uh, like how, how to make sure that uh, the, the uh, committee, the, the committees are really the, the platform or uh, the, the, I don't know, how can I say it, but the, yeah, the group or the platform that will really implement this, this intention that we have. And also things like, um, how do the affiliates feel about it? Uh, how uh, did the process happen? So how uh, our community think uh, participating in the process of uh, implementing those those groups? For example, I know that some people ask their ask, ask themselves like, is this a hub? So is this going to work like a hub? Uh, is this going to be uh, I don't know a side of the hub? So we there are lots of questions that we have to 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 make yet and to answer yet. But well, this is I think that we are. Uh, going very well in learning and evaluating the process and trying to make it as better as we can do. Erica, do you have two words about how the experience was for you as an affiliate, having your annual plan reviewed by a regional committee? <laughs> yeah, I definitely have more than two words about it. <laughs> so I'll be completely honest here. I value a lot this effort in the movement of trying to make things different while distributing resources But last year, when we were asking for the grant for Week Movement Brazil, it was a very stressful and traumatic experience for us. So we were experienced on asking for grants, for the annual grants. And it's usually a stressful process, of course, because it, it's going to define what you are going to do for the next year, right? So it's defining... Your staff is defining your activities, the impact that you will be able to make in your community, right? And we always live here with the sense of urgency because we are the single affiliate recognized in Brazil. So we are the only ones here who have the minimal structure to do something, to outreach with media, to support our volunteers, etc. And when it comes to asking for resources, it always comes with a level of uncertainty of what we are going to do on the short and on the long run. So, okay, I understand that. But for this particular model that wasn't still last year, it was 
way more exigent for us. So we had to prove ourselves a lot of times as if we have never uh, asked for a grant before, right? As if we were unknown to the movement. And we have this particular view that Brazil, it is part of Latin America, of course, but it's not really on practice of the Wikimedia movement, for example, because we have more partnerships and connections with other affiliates than the ones that are here in our region, right? So we don't even edit on the same projects. We speak Portuguese here, not Spanish, for example, right? So why should we share the resources with this region here if we don't even collaborate much in our own activities, right? So this felt quite excluded for us very stressful. We had to, you know, do a lot of paperwork and we were constantly uh, uncertain about how we were going to be evaluated by this new committee because we understood that they were not very experienced on evaluating grant proposals, right? And this is quite definitive for our future. And even though I really appreciate that people from different backgrounds are joining this conversation, it is not an experience, right? It actually defines our futures and our activities, our materiality here, right? So throughout the entire process, we were really uncertain about what was going to happen. And it comes with the tiniest details. For example, uh, we could make our proposal in Portuguese and they would provide a translation, but we wrote hundreds of pages for this proposal and we weren't sure that this could be properly translated so the evaluators could have enough time and understanding of what we were actually proposing, right? So this is the sort of things that need to be corrected in this process. And, and I don't regret anyone in particular. I think that people involved in this funding were great. They were doing their best, but the process itself... Uh, it still has a lot of gaps that need to be solved so we can trust in this process and make sure that we'll be able to accomplish everything that we are proposing here for our community. Because even though we are bold here in Brazil, we are also very realistic to our context, right? And we want to make the major impact possible here. And we are not afraid to do that, but we need the people to believe us, right? So it's hard for us to be constantly proving ourselves when there are those uh, grant rounds here. So this is my take, and I know that I said more than a couple of words, and I could be talking a lot more. <laughs> but yeah, so that's it in a short. So uh, um, I'll, I'll follow up with something, because to me, what, what this experience sounds, it sounds like it wasn't a great experience from either end of, of it. And we have both ends sitting here, somebody who's on the regional committee and somebody who's had to write a grant. And so like Nicole said, we added participatory to grant making, but maybe instead of um, having just grant making without participatory, we should just have participatory without grant making. If you, <laughs> if you catch my drift. Um, I'm th what I'm thinking is you know, we're, we're creating a system that is a, the, a classic philanthropic model of grant making. And then we're adding this patch onto it to make it more participatory and to have this sort of regional, you know, have the feeling like there's a regional say and there's a regional st strategic development. But and then you're saying it's for the whole region and it doesn't make sense for us. We need to be our own thing. Anyway, it, it feels like we're patching something that maybe we shouldn't have to begin with. So, um, I would pose the question maybe to anyone in this room <laughs> or in this channel, is grant making maybe not the system that we should use in the future for distributing resources in our movement? And should we maybe look to other movements who have other systems such as, such as resource sharing agreements, formulas and things like that? What, what do you guys think? Well, as I said before, I love the idea of reimagining what we do in the movement, right? And I think that we are in a good wave for that at this point. 
and we are experimenting and we have room to understand what is not working well and how things could be improved, right? So I'm not exactly opposed of this grant making model as it requires you to actually plan what you want to do, right? And this is a good exercise. And it's good for accountability as well to the movement because we can't forget that we are talking about resources that come from donation. Um, and there's no one size fits all solution when it comes to resource allocation across the movement. And this has to be very clear when we are talking about it, right? So given the wide range of contexts that we live. And what I keep thinking is also, should we measure the success be the same for every affiliate or by which standards? Who defines that, right? So uh, I think that we'll have more clarity about that, those differences in theory, right? We, now we have more clarity about those differences in theory, but not in our practices. Because if you're applying for a grant and you want to be approved, you are going to set up bold goals and metrics to prove to the evaluators your impact and how you make it work here, right? So although we have this beautiful discourse of respecting the local context, etc., we know that in practice we are going to be evaluated anyway and we have to, you know, show some sort of impact. And we are already overloaded here in the global south and, you know, marginalized communities as well. Uh, so I don't really have an easy answer because this is not an easy question, right? And this has to be taken into consideration as well. And what I think that is most unrealistic is not the model itself of grant making, but the resource allocation by regions, right? So how it is defined. So we should have a more open conversation about what resources exactly does the regions need, and specifically the affiliates and any other project that is interested in you know, requiring a grant. So it would be way more down to earth and not be um, you know, something imagined by people who are not living our own realities. So what you're saying is more of a decentralized model, but maybe a global formula that is based on some kind of needs assessment or, or assessment of, you know, where do we want to grow as a movement? And then but regional decision making about about how monies are allocated and, and spent. Um, I, you know, I, I hear your point about the, that grants are good because they create accountability. But to me, and this is my personal view, <laughs> it's grant means I grant you something, right? It's like this, it's, it's like this philanthropic gesture because I, you know, I want to do well for you. So I'm going to give you some money. And um, I feel like in a movement where we're talking about equity, knowledge equity, equity and decision making, like feeling like you've been being granted something is maybe not the, the right feeling you should have when you want to feel empowered. We come to our next segment, actually, uh, and that is called How About That? And we wanted to um, separate this a little bit from the interview. And it's like basically a hot take. And we turn to the inner workings of the movement. The Movement Charter Drafting Committee, or as some also know it, MCDC. Not ACDC, of course, MCDC. So this committee will create the Movement Charter, following the Movement Strategy recommendation, ensure equity and decision making. And it will define future roles and responsibilities in our movement. And this committee will, of course, not just go into a room and write a document, but will um, re do some research, consult with communities, but also with experts and organizations. And then when the document is final at one point, it will eventually also need to gain movement-wide consensus um, in terms of a ratification, probably. And the committee was formed last November Uh, in a combination of elections and selections and has 15 members and they are now expected to keep working until the charter is actually ratified and the current timeline forecasts it to be in late 2023. 
So for full disclosure, uh, we have among us today a member of said moving charter drafting committee, um, Erica, and we're really glad you're on it. And we're really glad the, the other people that are on it are also um, volunteering their time. Um, but when, you, when we talk today, obviously you're not speaking on behalf of the committee, but you're expressing your own opinions. So um, question to all of us, what, what are you, uh, and Lucas, you, you can of course chime in as well. Um, what do you see the movement charter drafting committee sort of, how do you see it working over the next year or so? And, and how do you see it reaching out and how, how should it, what should it do to come up with the best possible product for this movement that's going to last? Yes, I'm excited to talk about the MCDC work here. Although I'm not representing the full committee, this is my individual take on the work that we are doing. And this is definitely something that we are talking about right now. For example, how do we represent the movement charter drafting committee publicly, right? So this is the sort of discussion that we are diving and as you said, we started our work in last November and it's already April, almost May, you know, so a lot of things were happening internally in our MCDC. And this may not be very much visible for the entire community because it's a lot of operations and setting how we want to work together because there are people from so many different backgrounds and time zones. So this is a challenge on itself, right? So we have the support from the movement strategy team as well, and they are being respectful on our wishes to make this a movement from the community and not something that is led by the movement strategy team, right? So we have to balance all of that. And this is taking a while, but we are solving how to work together, finally. <laughs> so, yeah. And what I've been seeing for these last few months is that we need to respect our internal wishes and our internal flows for make the charter happen, while at the same time being accountable and transparent to the community, because we understand that there is a lot of expectations around what we are going to write on the charter, right? And we want this to be a very iterative process. So we are taking this work seriously in order to make an engagement proposal for the different stakeholders involved in it. Right. So what are the difference between, you know, a stakeholder being informed, being engaged, you know, being consulted. So we are diving into all of this right now so we can elaborate a full engagement plan for the stakeholders. So we are not, you know, working on the content on a closed room and suddenly drop the document. Hey, there it is for ratification. So don't worry, this is not going to happen. OK, so we are really taking all this careful measures to make sure that people feel heard in this process, because although we represent a lot of diversity of backgrounds and, you know, of knowledge uh, from the community in this committee, we also know that we still have gaps on it and we will love to receive the inputs from the different people in the community, people who were highly involved in it previously, but also people who didn't have the chance yet to speak in the movement strategy, right? So we have to design a strategy for it. So this is my take on the MCDC work so far. And please feel free to ask me anything else that you want from the MCDC. I'm glad to do that. Okay. Um, a little bit curious of uh, what Lucas thinks. Cause so Lucas, you did all this research with the, uh, the Brazilian community or the Lusophone community. Anything that came out of that, any sense you got um, from these communities on what, not how, sh how the MCDC should work, but what should be in the charter, what should definitely be in the charter to, to give those communities um, a better chance? Well, I was exactly thinking about this challenge, which is um, how can we think about a community as big as is the, the movement, the Wikimedia movement, and try to make something that makes sense for everyone or for every communities. So I, I think that uh, 
I, I keep thinking that this is may, maybe the main challenge because do we have the the real this is real uh, dimension of uh, what is the what are the complexities of different of the the, the different uh, communities that we have uh, in the Wikimedia movement? So um, I I don't really know what, uh, what we have in, in Brazil. Uh, this uh, said I, I don't know what, what to say, only what to feel. So uh, this is why why I <laughs> I think about it. Uh, well, uh, it's I think it's a big challenge, and I, I think that. Um, well, we really must and uh, think about. We, we need to figure out how to make not only the movement charter, but the whole process of building the chart, of writing this, this, uh, this uh, charter, uh, something that uh, is equitable, that is inclusive, that has diversity, and that really represents our community. So, something that I would ask, and and the big question I like to answer about it is. Uh, but maybe it will be only answered in the future is, do our community as a whole feel represented and feel uh, uh, listened and uh, watched uh, in this in this movement charter? Well, I think that this is, from, from its success on the movement charter w would be if we could answer yes, but I really think, and maybe I'm a pessimist, or maybe I'm just realistic that we won't achieve this uh, now, but maybe we could just build uh, something that will allow us to reach this this goal in the future. I'm, I have one more curious question <laughs> to Erica. What do you think are going to be the big topics? I'm trying to get to the content away from the process that are, that are going to be um, talked about in the Movement Charter. Yeah, so we are actually starting to discuss the Movement Charter outline and we'll publish that pretty soon. And the Movement Charter Drafting Committee is going together in Berlin in June so we can dive into this topic because we need to have the structure, the summary of the charter and define the methodology of writing this, the engagement plan, etc. So there's a lot of things that we still need to do, but regarding the content, we'll definitely talk about governance, resources, values and principles that we want to see across the movement, you know, um, so yeah, so this is basically what you can expect from this document. And, you know, governance itself, it's a major topic. So yeah, so it's a lot of things to discuss. And as I said, we are going to be very careful about it because we want people to feel represented on it. And I understand that people always complain we can't satisfy 100% everyone, but I think that is our duty to at least provide room for conversation and improve this document the most that we can. And then that's a wrap for today's conversation and, and also a wrap of the second episode of Wikimove. Thanks uh, to our listeners for listening. Thank you so much for our two interview guests for being here today, Erica and Lucas. It was a great pleasure to have you and um, I'm sure we'll talk much more about these issues over the next few years. So Wikimove is a production of Wikimedia Deutschland and its movement strategy and global relations team. And Nikki and me are here on stage, but behind the scenes, Eva Martin pulls all the strings in the background. She makes sure that our technology runs smooth, smoothly so that we can create excellent content for you all. And our music was composed and produced by Rory Gregory and is, of course, available under a free license, CC by SA, on Wikimedia Commons. And thanks again to your wonderful guests, Erica and Lucas. It's been a great pleasure. Um, we release two episodes every month. We hope that new ideas are born from these conversations in Wikimove and collaborations get kickstarted. Please visit our meta page and react to our podcast, connect with other listeners, subscribe to be always notified if a new episode releases. Um, please also let us know if you have questions. We'll announce the topic for the next show you, so you can uh, submit questions uh, to the uh, guests and you can also submit news that you want us to um, spread. And um, if you missed our previous episode, it was about knowledge as a service. So check it out on our meta page. And you can contact us at wikimove at wikimedia.de to continue this discussion and share your suggestions for next episodes. Ciao for now. Thanks, Thanks guys. See. Goodbye. Bye.